Take your Bibles and uh, turn to the book of Romans very quickly. Uh, I made a mistake. Well, I didn't follow all my notes this morning. It's what I didn't do. And I got done preaching and I sit in my office and I'm going, I left something out. And I uh, was telling somebody the other day, maybe it was you, that several years ago, I, I, you know, back in the old days when we wrote our sermons out, well, I had all my notes and there was something I was going to say during that sermon. And I thought, man, I don't want to forget that. So I circled it and drew big red arrows to it. And somewhere like in the middle of the sermon. Well, God got in that sermon. I started preaching. God started just working everywhere. I mean, God was dealing with people, and it was just one of those things that you knew God was doing it. Had everybody at the altar at the end of the service. We praying and crying and confessing things we'd never even thought of, and we were just, boy, we were just having a good time. Got all done, got my office, and I looked at my notes, and I went, Oh, I didn't say that! And then I got to thinking about it. Mike, you drew a big circle around it. You drew arrows pointing to it. You did everything in the world to make sure you'd said that. Apparently, God didn't want you to say it or you'd have said it. So I kind of think about that tonight. When I was uh, talking about Manasseh and Ephraim, I explained that what Jacob did was, Jacob was supposed to give the firstborn son right-hand blessing to Manasseh. The second born son, left hand blessing, because right hand's a hand of power, that's where the book is. Left hand is a weaker hand. We have a strong and a weak testament in our Bible and so on. Greater light, lesser light. But he crossed them. And he did it wittingly. So it now it doesn't follow the flow that we set this morning that the first born is not as good as the second born. Okay? And here we have Manasseh not getting the firstborn blessing. It just, he did that, crossed his hands. Why did he do that? And what I thought of was in Romans chapter 9. And God had actually said this about Jacob and Esau. Because if you remember from this morning... The angel of the Lord appeared to Rebecca and told her that you had two manner of son, two manner of people are in your womb, two different nations are in there, and God had already picked one over the other. And what that shows is that we are saved by God's election. He picks those whom he's going to save. And the Bible's specific about it. Before Jacob ever did anything, he was in the womb. What sin do you commit in the womb? What good deed do you commit in the womb? You don't. You just lay there and get big. And before Jacob and Esau had done anything, God had already selected who he was going to choose out of those two boys. Now, it so happens that God was right, wasn't he? He picked the right one. He didn't, he didn't pick Esau. And Esau was just, he was a beast. He gave up his birthright. He did this by his choice. He gave up his birthright. And that shows you that God's election of us, what they would call predestination, goes along the same direction as our choices do. And God knows that. God knows the outcome, David, of every choice you ever made are making now and will continue to make. God knows the outcome of every one of them. So, when he saves somebody, he does it and he chooses them before they do anything, knowing what they'll do. Look at Romans 9, verse 4. Paul says, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, 
came, of the flesh, Christ came. <clears throat> you, you pray for me. I'm losing, I, I'm losing my voice right now. And I still got three more hours of preaching to do today. Um, concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. What does he mean by that? Just because you were born a Jew does not mean that you're God's people. The new Israel now is decided upon faith and not works. So we are children of promise. We are of Israel. We are Israelites, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And he said, uh, verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. So was not Esau a seed of Abraham? Yes, but God didn't pick him. Because he says, uh, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And that seed is what he was referencing in, in Genesis chapter 12. For this is the word of promise at this time will I get will I come and Sarah shall have a son in verse 10 and not only this but when Rebecca also had conceived by one even by our father Isaac for the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth and you could write that down is God never picks a loser Never has. If God were to bet on horses, would he lose? No. Nope. If God were to play the lottery, would he waste his money? Nope. If God were to play you in chess or checkers, would he beat you every time? God would be the all-time Jeopardy leading champion. God is smarter than all the computers. Amen? Um... So verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Because God chooses one person over another, is there any, has God ever chosen the wrong one? That's what he means. Has God chosen somebody who really should not ever go to heaven because they don't believe him and they never followed God, they never trusted him? Does, is that how God picks them? No. God has never picked anybody to give them salvation that he didn't foreknow would choose it if they had the chance. And that was shown in Esau. Esau made a choice, a conscience choice choice to sell his birthright to Jacob. He chose that and God knew that he would. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that sheweth mercy. It's God's idea to forgive you. It's God's idea to save you. It's God's idea to call you. I, at times, I will struggle with salvation. I'll struggle with being called to the ministry. And uh, sometimes I just go, God, what were you thinking? Why did you pick me? God, I don't deserve this. I'm the last person in the world you should have called. And God always has a way of saying, Mike, that's why I called you. Because you don't think too well of yourself. I have these self-loathing exercises that I do once a week where I hate myself. And God seems to bless that somehow. All right. Genesis chapter 11. Turn there. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. I'm going to preach till five and hit the road. Got everything packed. I got DVDs down there and. And uh, taking the camera with me, I'll, I made an announcement a while ago on Twitter and Facebook. I'm not, I'm not going to stream the service. They already do that. You can watch them on Facebook. That's where they stream. That's their streaming platform. The church is called Church of Many Blessings. It's in Fredericktown, Missouri. 
if you go to Facebook, just type in Church of Many Blessings, Missouri, and you'll find that one. And the pastor's name is Ron Dagonia. And um, so anyway, that's I'll be down there. The, I think their service starts at 6. I don't know if they're going to sing a bunch of music beforehand or what. Uh, I'm going to leave that up to them for their service or whatever. And um, so just pray for me this afternoon. Appreciated the guys here came in, laid hands on me and prayed over me. And I really appreciated that. I really did appreciate that. And um, so look, I think God's going to bless it. Looking forward to it. All right. Now let's see here. Where was we going to go tonight? Genesis chapter 11. And uh, yeah, I've already packed the screen up too. Everything's gone. So you have to look in your Bible tonight. Now we're going to try to finish out Genesis chapter 11. We've dealt with the issue of the imagination. What caused God to come down and separate their languages? What, what is the difference if someone says they speak in tongues and they start speaking something that no one on earth knows? Is that of God? And I think the Bible is very clear on that. It is not of God. It is a, it is a spirit. There, I do believe there are spirits. And you can, you can actually see this in di- their Christianity is, and Pentecostalism is not the only re- religion in the world where people would speak in tongues. Then, um, and I don't know if I said this last Sunday or not, but there was a, uh, back in ancient times, the god Apollo was the god of prophecy. And anybody that wanted to know the future would go to the temple of Apollo and inside, which was in Delphi, and inside the temple of Apollo was called the Oracle of Delphi. Okay? So, and the Oracle was, there was a high priestess, a woman, and then there were four maidens who were in an inner sanctuary. And this is pretty much where they lived. And when someone would come in, they, they had to come in with a gift. They had to come in with money or something in exchange, something of value to give because their God doesn't work for free. Okay? And so they, they would come in and ask, okay, am I going to win tomorrow's battle? Or is my crops going to come out? You know, or who should my kids marry? Whatever thing in the future they wanted to know, they would come in and ask the oracle. And so the oracle would go into the holy place. And they would do some kind of ritual, song and dance or whatever. And all of a sudden, these four women would begin to speak in an unknown tongue. It's a language that nobody could decipher. But the oracle, the high priestess, would then somehow magically translate what they were saying. And then come back with, depending on the gift. If the gift was good, she would come out with a favorable prophecy. If the gift was, eh, then more than likely your crops are going to fail bad next year and your daughters are all going to marry drunks, okay? That's just how it is. But that's, that was a real thing that they did. And I do believe that there are spirits that speak in an unknown tongue. Let me, I didn't read this last week. I know I didn't. But one of the people that I follow I don't follow them because I think they're great people. I follow them because they are leading this world to the new world order. His name is Dr. Stephen Greer. He is an ER physician. He's a very intelligent man. But from his early days in college, he was reaching out to familiar spirits whom he believed were extraterrestrials from another planet who were here to pick certain people to help bring the world so that the world and the extraterrestrials could merge together. They're going to bring us to a new age. And most new age people believe the same thing. They may not call them UFO astronauts, but it's the same idea. And same idea as what's in Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom. Here's what Stephen Greer said. He had an incident when he was in college while he lived in the dormitories. Something that happened to him. He fell real bad sick. And these aliens, which were spirits, came to him, healed him. He was going to die, healed him. And then he was in regular contact with them. And here's what he said. This is in his book, Hidden Truth. He said, while in this state, asleep, he was meditating. I continued to have some kind of ongoing dialogue with these extraterrestrial beings. My roommate told me quite some time later that for a number of months he would awaken late at night and would hear me speaking quietly in my sleep. 
He said, you were speaking, but with a language not of this world. And I thought, oh my God. Somehow I was in a state of consciousness where I could connect to the language used by the Eli. E-L-I. That's what he called him. What is that word? Eli. It's in your Bible. Let me, let me give a phrase out of the Bible. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means what? My God, my God. That's who he called these aliens, these spirits. He said, I, I could connect to the language used by the Eli. And he was hearing that very clearly. He said, absolutely, it was not an earth language. So he had a spirit in him causing him to speak in a language that nobody knew. And this was prophesied in Deuteronomy, in uh, I think it's Isaiah, other places where God speaks of a people and a nation who's going to come from the ends of the earth, beyond the earth, literally, and they're going to speak a language that nobody knows and they're going to eat up all your cattle and they're going to take over your land and I'm going to bring you down and I'm going to build them up, God said. It was a curse, not a blessing. So, and then there was a man by the, the cultist by the name of John Dee. John Dee was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. He was an astrologer. And he was in contact also with beings that he referred to as angels. And these angels taught him or were trying to teach him a language that they spoke. Now, those who speak in tongues claim that they are speaking the tongues of angels. That the angels are, or the Spirit of God is giving them the language that angels use when they speak. So my question is this. Show me a place in the Bible where angels spoke and nobody understood them. When the two angels came to Lot in Sodom. Did Lot understand what they were saying? When the angel appeared to Samson's mother and father, did Samson's mother and father know what the angel was saying? When the angel came to the prophet Daniel and talked to him, did Daniel understand what he said? Yes. When the angel visited uh, Simeon and Elizabeth and told them about the birth of John the Baptist. Did they know what he said? Did Mary understand Gabriel? Yes Okay, did Jesus understand Satan? Every word Okay Now there is a place 2 Corinthians 12 where the man that Paul referred to went to the third heaven and heard unspeakable things That I believe but as far as angels, good angels, speaking some unknown language that nobody knows of, very, very little evidence of that. And no evidence in the Bible that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, he causes you to speak one of these angelic languages. The evidence is clear in the book of Acts, the book of 1 Corinthians 14, and other places that the language spoken was human languages understood by other people. And that's it. Um, let me read this verse. Proverbs 5, 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. And this strange woman is Babylon the Great. She's known as Diana in the New Testament, Ashtaroth in the Old Testament, Isis in Egypt, other places. Her, she's got different names. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. So what spirit is it that when it comes on you and you have no idea what you're saying or doing, what spirit is that? Is that the Holy Spirit or is that strange woman? That's, strange, that's the drunk strange woman. Hear me now, therefore, O children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. And remember, her name is Babel on. Named for that reason. And I was watching a 
video the other day about UFOs and the guy explained something about the Tower of Babel and he said Babel means the gateway to God. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It means... It means you belong in the loony bin. All right, Genesis 11, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and 30 years and begat Salah. And Arphaxad lived after he begat Salah 403 years. And what you're noticing here is the more generations that come, the younger they're dying. Whereas before the flood, everybody dies in their 900s. Now, by the time we are getting here to our fact said, 403 years he begat sons and daughters, and Salah lived 30 years he begat Eber. Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years, so he was 433 and he died. So we cut the, cut the length of time now in less than half. And begat sons and daughters. In verse 16, and Eber lived 430 years, <clears throat> begat Peleg. What is the significance about Peleg? We'll talk about it in a minute. And Eber is where we get the name Hebrew from. Shem is Semites, the Shemites. Eber is the Hebrews. And that's where the lineage of Abraham comes from. The Shemites through Eber. That's where we get those two words. Shem, uh, anti-Semitic or Semite, Semite and Hebrews. In verse 16, Eber lived 430 years, begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu. Now we have to go back to Genesis 10 where it, you, have, you have a doubling of this lineage here. And I believe it's done that way for a reason. Because my thing is in Genesis 10, 25, it mentioned Eber giving birth to Peleg. And it says, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. If you look up on the screen, I would have a map up there. But I don't. The people online are probably seeing it. But on that map, it, I, I remember being in elementary school. And the teacher pointing out that South America fit into Africa. And I went, wow. That just fascinated me. And she said, now, you know, scientists believe that, you know, billion years ago, everything was one land. And I'm going, wow. And then I read that in the Bible and I went, whoa. The whole earth was of one language. And if you go back to Genesis 1 and look at uh, day two of creation, where God separated the earth from the sea. The dry land he called earth. And it looks to me like he created one dry land and one sea. And that's how it was until after the flood. And what happened is after the flood, you have everybody in the valley of Shinar, Sumeria. And God says, it's not good. I'm going to bust them all up, send them all over the place. So what he did was... He follows this order. Genesis, he give, even though he gives the genealogy in Genesis 10, he's backing up and giving it again in Genesis 11 to show you how it happened. Genesis 11, first, God divides everybody by their speech. And I would say probably generally, you would have a family speaking a certain language and their next door neighbors speaking a different language because they're from a different line or a different family or a different tribe. So he's got everybody dividing up, first of all, into languages. And it wouldn't be hard to figure out who's speaking what. All you got to do is say, hey, who's, who knows what I'm saying? And you got people raising their hand. You go over to them. So they divided up that way. And they began to spread out. God divided them up by, by um, language by family, and they begin to move across that giant land. So we go from, back in Genesis 11, from Shem, we have Shem, our Faxad, Salah, Eber, and then Peleg. 
So five generations down from Shem, which could be the space of several hundred years, you have people spreading out across the land. And then... God did something. We don't know exactly what. We don't know how he did it. Maybe the meteor hit or whatever. But it split the earth. And these land masses started sliding. If you've ever looked at a map of North and South America, you'll see one thing that stands out. That starting all the way up north in Canada, you have the Rocky Mountains. They go all the way north in Canada, come all the way through America... And basically along almost the same line are the Andes mountain range, almost in a straight line with the Rocky Mountains. You ever notice that? And they're huge mountains, uh, nearly impassable. So let's say that the land mass is sliding across water. And it stops. What happens when your car hits a brick wall and stops? The mountains are not the remnants of the land around it deteriorating down. The mountains, even the evolutionist geologists say, the mountains are the result of tectonic shift and then it's stopping and pushing the mountains up. You see it in the Appalachian Mountains, you see it in the Rocky Mountains and the Andes Mountains. Boom! And then you go to Tibet and see the Tibetan mountain ranges where Mount Everest is. Boom, there's tons of mountains everywhere. Same in Switzerland. Boom, tons of mountains everywhere. So that's my theory of what happened. We got these mountains, we got all this language, and we got people spread all the way around the world from each other because of this one thing that God did. Okay? The New World Order seeks to bring all that back. Now, uh, let's see here where we're going from here. Now, let's go to uh, verse 27, Genesis 11. This is showing us how Abram came to be. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So we have three brothers born to Terah, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. So Lot was not the son of Abram. He was the nephew of Abram. Abram was his uncle. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of, Adam, or of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran. The father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no children. And Terah took Abram his son. And Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son. And Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So remember, where Abraham was born, he was born in Ur of the Chaldees. That was what the Bible would call the land of his nativity. Where he was born the first time. But where you're born the first time has no bearing on where you're born the second time. Amen. Aren't you glad that God lets people from Fredericktown go to heaven? Amen. And Arkansas, because that's where I was born. Okay? So, and that's, that's where this is going. To show us that Abram had to leave the land of his nativity, the land that he might have loved. He left that place to go to a different one. And verse 32, in the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, Genesis 12. And so far, every Genesis chapter has followed a number rule. Genesis 1, 1 is with, it stands for beginnings and things that come first. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. 2 is the number for division. And in Genesis 2, God took Adam, took a rib from him, made his wife, and the two became one flesh. That's what the number 2 means. Number 3 deals with sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's what Eve, that's what occurred to her in Genesis 3. She ate the fruit and sin came into the world and death by sin. So how many crosses were there on Calvary? Because he was numbered with the transgressors. 
Four is the number for the gospel. And I preached that this morning. That Cain represents Satan, who is of that wicked one. Abel represents Christ, whose deeds were righteous and his sacrifice accepted by God. And Satan had Jesus killed. Cain killed Abel. And you have a picture of the gospel there in Genesis 4. Five is the number for death, but victory over death. So you have the rapture when... Paul said, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and men shall be caught up together with them. The number six for preparation. And you can see the preparation of the ark in Genesis 6. You can also see the joining of the sons of God and the daughters of men. That's also what the number six. The number seven is the number for ending. Things are done. They're complete. They're final. God into the earth in Genesis 7. Eight, nine, and ten. Eight is the number for new life. Nine is the number for fruit bearing. That's what you see. Genesis 10 is the number for dominion. Genesis 11, the number 11 is the number for confusion. Okay, now 12. Why were there 12 tribes, 12 apostles? Why does the woman have a crown with 12 stars on her head? Why does Jerusalem have 12 gates? Why does it have 12 foundation stones? What is the significance of the number 12? Uh, earlier writers, um, and I read their books, said that, and they were good, said that 12 was for uh, governmental perfection. Well, that was when, when I read their books, I said, God, that, that sounds good, but I want to know from your word. I want you to show me from the Bible what the numbers mean. And so I don't, I don't mean to say these guys were wrong. It's just that I see something now. Genesis 12. And when, it, when I say this, it might make sense to you. It's the number for God's promise so he makes a promise in Genesis 12 the fulfillment of that is New Jerusalem with its 12 gates and what's written above those 12 gates males only females only whites only what names of the 12 tribes because that's what God promised them remember New Jerusalem is up in heaven and God said that Abram's seed would be as the stars of heaven the 12 foundation stones, the foundation of what is New Jerusalem is in the ministry of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, which is, it represents the word of God. And all of this starts in Genesis 12. And I want you to notice, Abram is not Abraham yet. God, here we go with this election again. Did God know that Abram was going to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Did God already know he was going to be obedient? Of course he did. So all the way before he does that, and this should help anybody who's struggling with salvation. I don't do enough for God. I'm not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. You're not Christ. He alone is worthy. Well, I've sinned. Of course you've sinned. Everybody has. Okay? God called you knowing the outcome. He elected you. He chose you. He knows that at the end of your life, your desire is to be in heaven with God for eternity. Okay? Not like the guy that I buried one time. I helped him out several times. He needed money. I helped him out. Went and visited his daughter. She was in a bad wreck, in a coma for a while, and I prayed over her. And uh, she did get better, by the way, praise the Lord. And he promised he would start going to church, but he never did. And when he left his house drunk one night, wrapped his car around a tree, they called me to do his funeral. So I did. It was a pauper's funeral, cardboard coffin. The family took up enough money to have a hole dug for him in an old cemetery way out in the middle of nowhere. And I preached the man's funeral and I preached salvation. And as everybody left, it was just me in the chapel. And I noticed some guys were waiting around and they had something in their hand. And Gary, I, boy, I almost walked out. I almost said, bury the guy. They walked up to his coffin, opened up an ice chest and pulled out iced bottles of Bud Light and stuck them in his coffin. I was furious. I did. I almost said, you guys bury him. I'm out of here. I'm not going to take part of this. We got to the cemetery and I got to thinking, well, he'll need him where he's going. 
but there's not enough and he won't get to drink them anyway. I just, I've never seen anything like that in my life. That man didn't want to go to heaven and God knew it. Oh, he wants to go now, but it's too late. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country. Notice that. Why does God make everything down here so hard? Why do we lose loved ones? Why do we lose friends? Why is our life difficult? Why is it that days of our lives are burdened? Why is it that gravity pulls us down, hurts our old back and hurts our knees and causes us to be weak? Why is it we lose things that we never find? Cars break down. Friendships break down. Relationships end. Why is everything in this world so hard? God wants us to hate it. Why is it that people with money never seem to have enough money? Why is it that we don't have their money? God knows we would love this world more than we love anything else. And he doesn't want us being that way. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Even if your family won't serve God, you have to leave them. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Now I want you to think about this. It is said now that Abram is the father of three religions. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. That's more than two-thirds of the world's population that either believe in Christianity in some form or Judaism or Islam. Okay? Surely, Abram ended up being that guy. A great man and a blessing to many people. Amen? Even if they got it wrong, he's still that way. The Muslims, they regard Abram as their father through Ishmael. The Jews, we be children unto Abraham. And as Christians, we believe that through Christ, we are the sons of Abraham. So he said, verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now I'm going to say this tonight. And I may go deeper into this. Uh, maybe next Sunday night if I remember it. Don't ever ask me. To say bad, evil things about the Jews. Now, I will tell you the truth about them. That they are very arrogant. I told you about having to see them when I was in Bible college. They don't talk to us, boy. They, don't, they think they're better than us. At the top of most conspiracies that are actual conspiracies in the world, there's a Jew sitting there. Jewish bankers, Jewish filmmakers, Jewish businessmen in this country. Evil people. Uh, Roy's nephew, Al, told me he worked at the Department of Justice. And he said, all the Jews that I worked with in the Department of Justice, he said, I never figured out. Because our nation stands to defend the people of Israel at the drop of a hat. We'll go to war for them. But those Jews... In Washington, D.C., hate Republicans and conservatives. They're all liberal and they vote Democrat. And the Democrats especially hate Israel. But the Jews vote that way all the time. He said, I don't figure it out. But I will say that Adolf Hitler had a point. I'm not saying he was right. I'm saying that Hitler knew that the people who were pro-communist in Germany were the Jewish movie makers and the Jewish newspaper article writers, Jewish reporters. He knew that if anybody was going to be pro-communist, it would be the Jews. Okay? Now, like I said, they're greedy people. They're arrogant people. They're very hateful people. Paul said 
in Galatians 4 that they're the ones who give us the most grief about our Savior. In the book of Acts, it was consistently the Jews who hated Christ, who hated the apostles, hated Paul, tried to kill him at every turn. The Jews were always there trying to get the Roman government to kill Paul for them. And finally succeeded. But, they are God's people. Now why do you think that if you were going to pick a group of people who were the most evil, the most in charge of all the bad things of this world, why would you think God would pick them over everybody else? Wouldn't God pick angels? Holy people? Saints? Wouldn't God pick, wouldn't God pick people who had a pure heart? Why would God pick the Jews? Why? Anybody want to take a guess? And I'll, I'll give you, first two guesses are right, no matter what you say. That's pretty close. The harder they are to save, the better God looks. That's pretty it. Okay? Now what does that tell you about when God would not let Paul go to Asia? Paul wanted to go to Asia, meaning he would have probably been in India, and then Malaysia, maybe into China and Japan. Paul would have been over there preaching, but God told him, no, you're not going over there. What does that say about them? Because most missionaries that work in the Far East have very little success. Okay? Whereas in the African nations, Christianity is fairly easy to thrive in most of those countries. Not, not the northernmost, they're mainly Islam. But nations like Kenya, we were looking at the Congo. The, I read the stats on Wikipedia, they're like 89% Christian there, or higher. Different, different breeds, but still, they're easy to preach the gospel to. But the Jews, they hate the gospel, they hate Jesus, they hate the New Testament, they won't touch it. They're half blinded, by the way. God put a veil over them deliberately. He will reveal himself in his time. But right now, they're the hardest of all people. And God himself said back in Deuteronomy 7, I didn't pick you because you were the best people. I didn't pick you because you were the most people. I didn't pick you because you were good looking. I picked you because I loved you. It's as simple as that. Love, love has no explanation, does it? When you love somebody, there's just no explaining it. You just love them. Okay, so that's what he did. So Abraham, verse four, and, and here's what I was going to say. Don't ask me to believe in replacement theology that says that we now are the only Israelites that God accepts. Don't ask me to believe that. There was a guy that was coming to this church that rolled off into that. And I, I saw it coming. And he finally came to me in my office and argued with me and cut me off and interrupted me while I was trying to explain to him from scriptures. And I finally said, look, if that's how you're going to believe, I'm not going to go along with that, period. So he left. And he probably won't come back. Don't ask me to replace them. Don't ask me to curse them. Don't ask me to do anything. Because I believe that promise is intact. I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse them that curse thee. Where's Adolf Hitler right now? Why? He cursed God's people. They were the apple of God's eye. And when God comes back, here's what I think is going to happen. Right now, the sun is shining on the Gentile world. And Israel is in darkness. But I think the world's going to turn... And God's going to shine the light on Israel and put the Gentile world in darkness. Amen? That's what I think is going to happen. I think God's going to open their eyes. So verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. Good old Lot. Boy, Lot was... He, he picked the right guy then, didn't he? He had another uncle he could have lived with. He chose Abram. Saved his life. And uh, Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, think about this. He's already 75. 
which would make Sarah about 65 at this time. Okay? Now, I don't know when everybody in here quit having children. But I bet you didn't wait till you were 65 to stop. Okay? And here's what Sarah is. When did she have Isaac? How old was she? 90 years old. That's old. She's a picture. Isaac is the child of promise. The new man. The hidden man in us. The inner man. The outer man dies every day. The inner man is renewed every day. Sarah's a picture of the old body holding in the new man. It's a picture of us right now. That's who she is. So verse 5, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, as I said before, back in verse 1, the Lord said, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And I won't, I'll read this. I won't have time. I need to get on the road here in a little bit. Because I haven't eaten yet. And I'm going to stop and get me a mushroom burger. My wife just rolled her eyes just now. I guarantee you she rolled her eyes. <laughs> guarantee it. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Listen. When God saves you, He calls you out. You don't hang around the same hangouts. You don't run with the same chickens. You don't, you don't feed on the same old junk. You don't believe the old ways. You don't want to get the old gang back together for one more big blowout. When God saves you, He separates you from all of that. You have to make a choice. Are you going to leave and go with God? Or are you going to stay here? In Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith Abraham... When he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Had Abram ever even seen it? No. And he went out not knowing whither he went. When God called Israel to follow Moses, after 400 years, there wasn't a man alive who even remembered what the old homestead looked like. They had no idea. They didn't even know where it was. They left in faith, not knowing where they were going. All they had was God saying, it's a land that floweth with milk and honey. That's all they had. Now, I don't have to have a near-death experience, go through the tunnel of light, end up in heaven to be able to come back and tell you, heaven, I think, is the place that I want to go to. I don't trust that stuff. And I don't have to do it. Because I have, in my Bible about as complete a uh, description of heaven as any man can describe heaven in human language. I have it here in my Bible and everything that I know and believe about it makes me want to go there. The mere fact that God is going to wipe the tears out of my eyes for good tells me I wouldn't care if it was on top of a mountain, down in a valley, in a hole somewhere or up on top of a tree somewhere, I'm going to go there just to get that one thing. So he said, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations. And what foundations is he referring to? What we see in Revelation uh, chapter 20, I think, or 21, where it says there's 12 foundation stones with the names of the 12 apostles on there. See that number popping up? The city which hath foundations. And the number of foundations is 12, and that's the number chapter that God promised him in. Whose builder and maker is God. That tells me right there what I want to know. If God made it, I want to go. I love this place. I love the beauty of it. I love the, the differences in it. I love all of that. Looking up the stars at night, the clouds by day, 
the beauty of trees and grass and mountains and hills and rivers and everything. I love that stuff. Heaven's got to be better than this. Amen? It's got to be. But I want you to notice, and then we'll close. God promised Abram this before he changed his name and before Isaac was offered. God knew you would be saved. And if God knew it, and he sealed you with that Holy Spirit of promise, he intends to keep that which you've committed unto him against that day. You can't trust banks, can't trust politicians, can't trust the electoral college, and you can't trust the media and salesmen. But you can trust the Bible. Amen? God made the promise and he intends to keep it. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for making great and precious promises to us and for never failing us. And Father, we believe you. It is by faith, Father. We've never seen heaven. We don't need to. I've never experienced hell. I wouldn't believe anybody that said they died, went to hell and came back. I wouldn't believe them. So God, I don't need to go there. I don't need to see it first. I'm like Abraham. You made the promise. You intend to keep it. You made me an offer I just could not refuse. And Father, without even seeing it, only in my mind's eye through the scriptures, I believe you. I believe you. And I look forward to going. I look forward to being there with the people I know and love. And Father, that's my only thing. God, is that if you let me go, I don't want to be there alone without my family. God, save them too and keep them like you've kept me. Bless this night, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.